tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai ki te aka matoa o te ture, o Jeff Shurtif, taku ringa, he kai kōmi hana hau. Uh, welcome everybody to the Law Commission and to our webinar on uh, the law relating to adults whose decision making is affected. Uh, my name is Jeff Shurtcliffe. I'm the commissioner leading this project. And joining me on this uh, webinar is Megan Ray, who is our project lead. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Megan Ray, uh, Hello everybody, my name is Megan. Uh, as Jeff said, I'm a member of the team here at the Commission working on the uh, review of adult decision-making capacity law. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us uh, this evening. Um, before we get into things, um, we'll just cover uh, four brief housekeeping matters. Um, so the first thing to know is that if you have any questions for us uh, during the webinar, um, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, this is a button that you should see at the bottom of your screen, um, which you can click uh, to type in a question. Um, a couple of things to note about the Q&A function. Um, your, que your questions will automatically be sent just to our team, so the other participants won't see them. Um, if you want to know how you can make a submission, um, that information is all on our website, uh, so you can find that information online. Um, because we have limited time today, um, we may not have a chance to answer everybody's questions. Uh, so if your question hasn't been answered by the end of the webinar, um, please feel free uh, to send us an email or again, get in touch with us through our website. Uh, the last thing to note on the Q&A function, uh, is that we won't be using the other functions like raising hands. Um, so if you do have a question, um, just make sure to click that uh, Q&A button. Uh, so with that said, the second matter uh, to cover before we get started is just to let you know that we aren't able to offer legal advice or uh, to respond to questions about your personal circumstances. Um, if you do need legal advice, um, there's a couple of options. You can contact your local community law centre, uh, your local community uh, citizens advice bureau, um, or you can use the Law Society's online uh, Find a Lawyer service. Um, and again, all the details for those are available on our website. Um, third piece of brief housekeeping is just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. So uh, you can go back and refresh yourself on, on anything um, <clears throat> at, uh, at your leisure uh, later on. We'll post it to our project website. Um, cameras and microphones are off, so there won't be any identification of any of the participants at this webinar except for us. Uh, and the final thing that I wanted to say um, is that we recognise that uh, listening to discussions about the law and practice concerning adults with effective decision making um, may remind you of difficult times in your life and difficult experiences. Uh, so you might want to have uh, a support person to uh, watch this webinar with you. Or if you need to talk to someone, you can call or text 1737 uh, to reach a free helpline service where you can talk to a counsellor. It's a 24-7 uh, uh, service. It's provided by Whakarangoro Aotearoa, New Zealand Telehealth Services. Um, and again, we've uh, the details are on our website, but we're also posting it to the chat function now. So if you need at any point a reminder of how to, um, how to contact them, it'll be there for you. So that's the housekeeping done. Um, now we'll talk about what you're all here for, which is our review. Yes, so in this webinar, we're going to cover uh, five main topics. Um, so we'll start by giving a brief overview of who Te Akamatua Ōtitore is and what it is that we do. Uh, second, we'll tell you what this review is about in a bit more detail and why we'd really like you to make a submission. Uh, the third thing that we will cover is explaining uh, the process that we've been through so far um, and what we're doing in this consultation process that this webinar is a part of. 
Um, the fourth thing we'll cover is we'll talk a, in a little bit more detail about some of the main issues uh, and topics that we're asking for people's views on in this consultation process. Um, and the fifth and final thing we'll address is uh, we'll talk about what happens after this public consultation closes. Um, and then once we've gone through those five things, hopefully we should have um, some time at the end of the webinar to answer uh, any of your questions. Uh, so I'll come back to Jeff uh, to get us started. Thanks, Megan. So the first thing is, who are we? Who is Te Akamato Te Ture Law Commission? Um, so we are an independent state sector organisation uh, and we provide law reform advice to the government. So what that means is that the government asks us for advice on uh, particularly areas of law, um, how those laws should be uh, reformed. Uh, now we're different to a lot of state sector entities um, because we're independent. And what that means is that although the government asks us to review particular areas of law, it doesn't tell us what conclusions we should get to. It doesn't tell us how we should go about um, our review uh, and what recommendations we should make. Uh, so when we're asked to review of an area of law, um, we approach it with a very open mind. Uh, we do a great deal of research, both in New Zealand and overseas. Um, and, and we listen to the views of the public, and in particular, people who had experience of the laws that we're reviewing. Uh, and then we make recommendations to government on how we think the law should be improved. Um, now, the ball is then in the government's court. It, the government will... Um, lay our report before Parliament, it will respond to it, but we don't have any say in what changes the government might make in relation in response to our report or when uh, they might do them. Um, so just bringing us back to this consultation process and this webinar, it's really important for us in any review to hear from people who have actual life experience of the law that we're reviewing. Um, to be able to make recommendations that will improve the law and that will work on the ground, um, we, we have to hear from people who've been engaging with, um, with those laws uh, and who've been directly affected by it. So that's who we are and why we're here. Megan. Um, I'll now cover the second thing uh, that we wanted to talk about in this webinar, which is what this review is about. Uh, so, as you'll know, we are reviewing the law and practice relating to adult decision making capacity. Um, as the name suggests, uh, we're considering how the law should respond um, when an adult's decision making is affected. Um, and this can happen for a really wide range of reasons. Um, as in a really wide range of situations, um, including dementia, uh, learning disabilities, uh, experiences of mental distress, um, quite brain injuries, and a really wide range of other uh, experiences. Uh, under the current law, if an adult's decision making is affected, uh, the law may treat their decisions differently to how they would treat another person's. Uh, and this is based on the concept of decision making capacity. And if a person is assessed not to have decision-making capacity, uh, their decision might not have legal effect uh, and another person might be appointed to make the decision for them. Uh, that person might be a welfare guardian, uh, an attorney point appointed under an enduring power of attorney, um, a property manager. Uh, another common situation is when a person has uh, an advanced directive uh, that might get activated if they're assessed to have lost decision-making capacity. Um, there are some situations, but it's a really what there's a really wide range of situations where capacity uh, can become relevant uh, in law. Uh, the main law in this area, um, and one of the main focuses of our review, um, is called the Protection of Personal and Property Rights Act. Um, however, there's a wide range of other laws and legislation which involve adult decision-making capacity in some way um, and we're taking a broad look across 
um, the laws in Aotearoa New Zealand uh, to see which of those need to be updated or changed. Uh, over recent years, there's been um, a number of calls uh, for the law in this area to be reformed um, to make sure it works well for people with effective decision making um, and those supporting them and working with them. Um, and the Minister of Justice uh, has therefore asked Te Akamata or Te Ture, the Law Commission, uh, to carry out a review and to make recommendations to improve the law. Uh, so what that means um, in a nutshell is that we will consider how the law should respond when an adult's decision making is affected. Um, now there's a lot more detail of our terms of reference which are on our website. I'm not going to go through all of those here. They, they go through in some detail some of the key issues that we're going to look at. Uh, one thing though that I thought um, we should emphasize is that a key thing that we are thinking about is how the law should strike the right balance between on the one hand enabling people to make their own decisions about their own lives and with support of whānau and family and friends and carers and on the other hand keeping people safe from harm safeguarding people from harm mm -hmm. and that's a really important balance that we need to focus on in making our recommendations and so we're thinking hard about that in everything we do in our review. So we've covered who the, uh, the Law Commission is and what this review is about. Uh, so now we'll move on to the third topic that we are going to cover today, uh, which is uh, a bit more detail about our process. Uh, so what we've done so far and what's happening now in our consultation period. Uh, so on what we've done so far, uh, our terms of reference that Jeff mentioned uh, were published last October. Um, and since then, we've been uh, carrying out research to underpin our review. Uh, so looking at things like identifying issues with the current law, um, looking at overseas developments uh, to see what's happening in other countries in this area. Um, we've also spent a lot of time thinking about public engagement. Uh, we know that the laws in this area affect a really wide range of people um, and, can have a, and can have a huge impact on people's lives. Um, so we really want to hear from people about how they think the law could be improved. Um, and we've spent a lot of time uh, planning and consulting with different organisations and community groups about how we can make our engagement process as accessible and as easy to engage with as possible. Uh, we've also established two expert advisory groups to guide us through our review. Um, so one of those is made up of uh, people with personal lived experience of the law and practice in this area, um, as well as whānau members and carers. Uh, and our other expert group uh, is made up of a range of lawyers, academics and ethical professionals. Um, and we've also held a wānanga uh, with experts in our Māori and tikanga Māori. And all of that has led up to our, um, the publication of our uh, preliminary issues paper, um, which hopefully you will have seen on our website and the consultation process that we've just kicked off. So um, a bit about that consultation process. As Megan mentioned, we've published our preliminary issues paper um, to support this round of consultation. Um, that issues paper provides some information um, about current law and practice relating to adults with effective decision making. Um, and it asks 20 questions um, about people's experiences with current law uh, and what they think about some of the, the big issues and the guiding principles that we should use in our review. And the main goal for the preliminary issues paper and for this round of consultation is to hear about people's experiences of making decisions about their lives or having other people make decisions about their lives. Um, as well, as I mentioned, is getting, um, uh, seeking feedback on some big picture issues and some principles, but a key focus is hearing from people about their experiences. Um, so we've tried to write the preliminary issues paper in a way that that will make it as easy as possible for people to engage with it. Um, and in particular, in addition to the preliminary issues paper, 
we've provided a summary, a 12 page summary. Uh, it's obviously a lot shorter than the preliminary issues paper. Uh, importantly, it has all the core information from the preliminary issues paper, and it has all the same consultation questions. So um, people who are not in a position to read a 70 page preliminary issues paper, um, but uh, have time for the summary, all the questions will be the same and the core information which explains those questions is in the summary. Uh, the other thing to note um, is that the summary, both the, the issues paper and the summary are, are available in large font format as well as standard format, but the summary uh, is also available in Te Reo Māori, in Easy Read, uh, in New Zealand Sign Language, uh, in Braille, um, and in audio format. Um, so we've we've tried to put a lot of work into making the summary in particular as accessible as possible to as wide a range of people as possible because it's really important for us to hear from as wide a range of people as possible about their experiences. Yeah. So now that we've covered uh, a bit about the process, uh, we'll move on to the core topic uh, to cover in this webinar, uh, which is uh, going over some of the uh, key topics and issues that we address in the preliminary issues paper. Uh, and rather than going through this webinar, just going through it by section by section, uh, we just thought we would give you a bit of an overview of the sorts of things that we're asking for people's views on in the consultation. Um, and you probably have some familiar, familiarity with these um, topics already. Uh, so one of the first things that we seek people's feedback on is language. Uh, we, particularly the kind of language that we are proposing to use in our review uh, when talking about different people or groups who are affected by the laws in this area. Uh, for example, we ask for public feedback on uh, the language we use in relation to disabled people, people with lived experience of mental distress and other groups. Um, and we've put this first because we know that language is really important to people and we know that people have uh, often have strong views um, about the language that they would like to see used. Um, so we thought that was important to get people's feedback on. Um, another important thing we discuss in the paper uh, and ask questions about is our Māori understandings of decision making. Uh, for example, we discussed some tikanga principles that were identified at a wānanga that we held earlier this year. And uh, we asked whether these are uh, the most relevant concepts and principles uh, in relation to tikanga around decision making. Um, we really want to hear about um, whether the law makes space for Māori to act in accordance with, in, with tikanga when uh, someone's decision making is affected and what changes could be made to uh, enable that. Um, and a third topic that we're seeking public feedback on in the paper is uh, the guiding principles for our review. Uh, so we use guiding principles in our work to help us identify core values or objectives uh, that need to be considered in a law reform project. Uh, we set out seven proposed principles uh, to guide us in our review, um, and we're looking for public feedback on whether we've got those right. Um, we've also spent some time in, in our paper uh, talking about the different ways that people can be involved in someone's decision making. Um, someone's who, who, whose decision making is affected, how other people can be involved um, in their decision making. Some of those processes already exist under current law, um, things like enduring powers of attorney and welfare guardianship um, under the uh, Protection um, Personal Property Rights Act. Um, and we've got some consultation questions around how well or otherwise those processes have worked for people. Um, but there are other arrangements that uh, that aren't recognised in, in the law or that the law could make work potentially better. And so we've asked some questions um, about those. Things like collective decision making. Um, the law doesn't currently 
make space at all really for collective decision making processes but we know that it's something that people are very interested in so we've asked some questions um, about that uh, and we also ask about supportive decision making um, you know whether you have been supported to make a decision or have supported somebody else to make a decision supported decision making is is a really important part of of our review and so we do ask some questions uh, about that and about how well you think uh, it has worked uh, and what could make it work better. Um, another topic, as I mentioned before, uh, a key focus for us is how the law should strike the right balance between on the one hand enabling people to make decisions about their own lives with support and on the other hand keeping people safe from harm. So we ask um, some questions in the issues paper about what happens or what should happen when decision making arrangements go wrong. Um, what can be done to keep people safe if things aren't working the way that they're intended uh, to work? So um, what safeguards should there be um, for enduring powers of attorney, for supported decision making, uh, etc. Now we've, we've done this by setting out some fact scenarios because we've found and we've been advised that it's much easier for people to engage with those questions if there's a fact scenario for them to think about. So you'll see in the issues paper and in the summary that there are some specific fact scenarios and then we ask questions about those. Um, and finally, but importantly, we, we just we've got a very general question about whether there's anything else that you think we should be thinking about that you think we should know that as I mentioned the issues paper is not um, comprehensive um, and there may well be other things that people think it's really important that we think about in the next stage of our review so we really want to hear about those and because this is only the first of two rounds of consultation we've also asked some questions about how people found this round so what could we do better next time to, to make the second round even more accessible? So that's a whistle-stop tour of the preliminary issues paper. Um, so we've reached the final topic for this webinar, uh, which is what happens after uh, this consultation period closes. Uh, and the closing date uh, for submissions uh, is the 3rd of March, 2023. Uh, so once consultation closes, uh, we'll review all the feedback that we've received um, and we will use that to develop some options to, uh, that, would, that might improve the law. Uh, so we'll be analysing feedback and then we will run a second round of public consultation uh, in the second half of 2023. Uh, that second public consultation will be supported by a longer consultation document and that will uh, set out information about the current law in more detail and it will present some options for reform for the public to give their feedback on. Uh, once that second round of consultation is closed, we'll then move on to preparing our final report. Uh, the final report will make recommendations to the government about how we think the law could be improved in this area. And uh, as we noted earlier, our target date for providing that report is the 30th of June, 2024. Um, so that is a quick scamper through the, the preliminary issues paper and, the, and, and our current consultation process. Um, we've had some questions come in and we've got time to address those. So we'll um, we'll just work through those um, in the, the time that we've got uh, available. Do you want to start? Yes, okay. I'll, I'll kick this off. So um, we had a question sent through uh, in advance, um, which was, uh, will this review cover adults with high and complex needs who are able to comprehend and or speak for themselves? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, this uh, review does cover um, adults in that group. Um, we know that this is a group for whom uh, the Protection of uh, Personal and Property Rights Act is um, particularly important. And we've heard 
a lot already about what uh, is not working well with this legislation for this group and, and those supporting them and what might work better. Um, and we're working closely with a range of organisations uh, in this consultation period to hear from different groups with lived experience. Um, so we are trying to make sure that we hear from people who might otherwise not be able to have their um, to contribute to these sorts of processes. Um, thanks, Megan. Uh, another question is, are we consulting with uh, disability support providers, many of whom become the voice for people who struggle to be heard themselves? Yes, I mean, we, we want to hear from everybody, actually. Um, and we certainly realise that uh, carers and disability support providers uh, are have a really important voice and have some uh, really detailed knowledge of how uh, the current law works. So yes, we have talked to a number of disability support providers. Uh, we know there are more. Uh, we're very much hoping to, to hear from them um, in this round of consultation. Um, and we can take this as an opportunity to to encourage you to share to share this widely that we've tried to distribute our um our materials as far and wide as possible but there's there's lots of people that are, um, have an interest in this area um so if there's people that you think would have an interest in this in this review and um, please direct them to to our website and, yeah. and encourage them to, to um subscribe for updates and make submissions um, we've got another question here, um, which is, can the law be written in plain, simple English language, avoiding legalese, um, which only serves to confuse those without legal background? Um, and I think that's something that we've definitely heard quite strongly already, um, both in relation to the law itself, but just the processes generally that, that people can find them quite hard to navigate, particularly um, when... Uh, in situations like the activation of enduring powers of attorney, they can often be quite stressful and, and upsetting times in people's lives. So um, we have well, that's um, something that's really important for us to consider. And um, we have asked some questions in the um, preliminary issues paper, not just about what the processes should be, but what can make them work better, like more clear um, drafting um, and clear um, instructions. So um, that, those are things we definitely be front of mind for us. Uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, another really good question um, here. There are many ethnic groups in New Zealand. Many of them have very little knowledge on this issue. How will we include them in a consultation process? Language can be a barrier to engage. Uh, yeah, we're really conscious of that. Um, uh, we we are in touch with um, some Pacific Peoples organisations um, and that includes, we're arranging uh, a little brief blurb about, about our process to be translated into some Pacific languages for circulation amongst the Pacific community communities. Um, we're also uh, doing the same uh, with a Chinese um, language um, uh, introduction, which we hope, which which will be actually published in in um, Chinese language newsletter. Uh, we're really conscious that this is really difficult, um, and um, without wanting to look like I'm passing the buck, if if anybody has any ideas for how we can um, at least make more people in communities who would otherwise not have law commission processes on their radars, then we'd really like to hear from it, hear, hear from you. So please do feel free to send us a message or include it uh, in your submission. As I said, this is only the first of our two rounds of consultation. And even if we don't manage to, to get everything perfect this time, we get another opportunity to try and, and improve. So we're really interested in, uh, in any thoughts that, that you might have on that. Thank you for the question. Um, we've got we've got some time for a few more questions. Um, okay. So I've got one pen here, which was um, whether um, we sp we're still wanting to hear from people um, who don't have personal lived experience, um, and want to emphasise that we 
absolutely do want to hear from as wide a range of people as possible, whether you have personal uh, lived experience or not. Um, we've tried to tailor this paper to be um, as easy as possible for people to tell us about their personal experiences with the law. Um, but we're really interested in hearing um, from anyone who has feedback to share, um, especially, you know, at this stage of the review when we haven't um, developed options yet. Um, we're, we're happy to hear from as many people as possible and we're trying to get as many insights as possible. Um, so legal, medical professionals, uh, support workers, anyone who has thoughts, um, we're really happy to hear them. Uh, there's another question here, uh, another good one. You guys are asking good questions. Um, this one uh, says the current laws talk about decision making as being something that adults are wholly, in, wholly capable or wholly incapable of, uh, whereas in reality, a person's capacity to make an informed decision can vary depending upon the decision. Uh, is this level of nuance, grey area and the definition of capacity likely to be considered? Uh, this will absolutely be considered. Um, we're very conscious that the way the law currently works is um, for any particular decision, it says you either have capacity or you don't. And if you do, then you can make your own decision. And if you don't, then your decision might not be um, given legal effect. Somebody else might make the decision for you. And we're very conscious that in reality, that's not how people make decisions. We all find some decisions at some times in our lives more easy or more difficult than at other times and other decisions. So we are very definitely thinking about how the law can uh, can respond to that um, and still achieve what we're seeking to achieve, which is striking that balance between enabling people to make decisions about their own lives with support and keeping people safe. Uh, and the second part of that question is the definition of capacity likely to be considered very definitely. Um, there's a lot of thinking um, about if you're going to have an idea of decision making capacity, what should it be, how should it work, how should it be assessed and what role should it play in the law. So all of those questions are very definitely front of mind for us. Thank you for the question. Um, I've got another question um, around uh, um, the government and when they will introduce a new law um, and just want to be clear that um, that that's not uh, up to us and um, we are a uh, an advisory uh, body so the law uh, the the government refers areas of law for us to review and we go back to them with recommendations um, but once we've provided our recommendations, we then don't uh, have a say in whether they will be implemented or not. That's for the government to decide. Um, so we will provide our final report uh, in June 2024. Um, but from there, it's it's then for the government to decide um, what uh, law changes it would want to make and uh, when it would want to make those. Uh, there's another question. Um, uh, here um, about can I meet with you one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. Um, it's not that we don't want to hear from people. It's that we're a very small team trying to engage with five million people uh, with a, a, a whole range of people and organisations. Uh, we're just not in a position to to take submissions by meeting with people. Um, but that doesn't mean, it really doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. We definitely do. Um, so please do uh, make a submission. Um, and the submissions you can make, you can do online um, on our website. You can just click through and answer all the questions or you can download a submission form. Um, you can also make submissions by text uh, or you can just, you know, um, write to us and all those details are on our website. Okay. Um, we've had another question come through, um, which is uh, around the role of GPs, general practitioners. So um, this question says, GPs are very important in deciding whether a person has capacity or not. Uh, we have seen different types of capacity assessments done by a GP um, and some assessments were poorly conducted. 
uh, will you create in GPs in this process? Um, and that one is also uh, firmly in scope for us. Um, we've, and, and that's, again, a concern that we've heard a lot around um, the quality of uh, capacity assessments. Um, sometimes those not being done when they should be being done, um, but also then the quality of, of the assessment itself. Um, and that's something that we'll certainly be looking at is um, not only around what the law says about what a definition of capacity it says, um, but who should be assessing it, who should have a role in that process. Um, we've heard um, already uh, views that um, it sh capacity assessment should be a much more holistic process, so not just done by a medical practitioner, but um, by involving other people in the person's life, their Fano friends and supporters. Uh, so that's that's one view that has come through already um, and I'm sure there's other other views as well um, so we will be thinking a lot about that and um, particularly keen to hear about people's experiences on the on the ground and what has what has worked well mm. as well as what hasn't worked well because that will be really helpful for us in thinking about uh, options uh, for reform. Uh, I'll, I'll just add to that that uh, one of our um, expert advisory groups that Megan mentioned earlier uh, has several uh, doctors uh, uh, on on that group. So we're certainly um, uh, trying to get uh, a wide range of views um, from from doctors as well as people who aren't doctors um, and even some lawyers. Um, uh, maybe I can, um, uh, can answer a question that came in about how our review relates to the uh, repeal and replace review uh, of the Mental Health Compulsory Assessment and Treatment Act. Uh, and for that matter, uh, how it relates to the Royal Commission into Abuse and State Care, um, the Waitangi Tribunal um, Health Kaupapa Inquiry. Um, our review is separate to all of those. Um, we have our own terms of reference uh, and um, so we're not part of those reviews. On the other hand, we're definitely aware of them, we're following them, um, and we will definitely factor them into not just our research, but um, also our, our final uh, recommendations. Um, uh, the the uh, summary of submissions for the Mental Health uh, Act review, uh, we actually found really helpful um, it, as we were working through our thinking here and we'll continue to pay close attention to all those things and make sure that that they're properly taken into account. Um, we've got uh, one more question here um, which is about uh, the ways of making a submission um, which has asked uh, can I make a submission uh, by phone? Uh, so as Jeff noted on our website um, we've set out the different ways that we'll um, be taking submissions. Um, so that's primarily through the uh, online uh, submission form that you can fill out on our website. Um, but we're also happy to accept uh, submissions uh, directly to our email address. Um, and we also have a, a text number, so you can text, people can text in submissions. Um, and the number for that, if you don't have it, is zero two nine seven seven nine nine zero zero nine. And the final way that we will take uh, submissions uh, is uh, via post, um, which I don't have to, the address to hand, but is also on our website. Um, those are the main ways that we are accepting submissions, and that's primarily because, again, we're a, we're a small team and. Um, aren't able to, to manage um, all avenues of submissions, unfortunately. Um, but as we said before, um, we're always looking to learn about different things that we could do um, that would work better for people. Um, so we haven't been able to offer that for this round, but we would encourage people, uh, if they aren't able to 
um, make a submission through one of those rounds to get in touch with us and we can talk yeah. about what we might be able to do um, and also to give us feedback generally uh, on how the our engagement process has gone for people whether people found it easy to find information uh, whether they found it easy to make a submission um, and we'll certainly factor that into um, what we do going forward. Uh, we've just got time for one more question <laughs> which is why are we consulting over the Christmas period? Um, in the best of all possible worlds, we wouldn't need to do that. But this review is so important to so many people that we really wanted to have two rounds of consultation. And to have two rounds of consultation and still get our report to the Minister by 30 June 2024, we simply had to consult over this period. We simply had to publish our preliminary issues paper in November. Um, but we're very conscious that people um, want to go to the beach and not think about things. And people may well not want to actually think about distressing things over the holiday period. So we've got a much longer consultation period than we would normally have. That's why we've allowed 14 uh, weeks uh, for consultation so that people can enjoy the festive season uh, and then have the second half of January and the whole of February to to think about our preliminary issues paper to make a submission so uh, we would it would have been nice if we could have avoided that but we couldn't uh, and I think that that um, means we're almost out of time so um, if I can just uh, make a few concluding uh, comments the first is a couple of thank yous uh, and the first thank you is to Laura and Scott our New Zealand sign language interpreters thank you very much for for uh, interpreting I don't know how you do it but I'm very glad you do uh, Second thank you is to all of you who have tuned in. Um, we're really grateful for the interest you've shown. Uh, we're really grateful for your questions. Uh, we hope this has been helpful. Um, uh, and uh, we hope that, that we hear from you um, before the 3rd of March with your submissions. Um, just a reminder on our website, capacity.govt, oh, sorry, capacity.lawcom.govt.nz, you can access the preliminary issues paper, you can access the summary, you can find out how to make a submission, you can make an online submission, and submissions will be open until the 3rd of March 2023. So we encourage you to, uh, to go to the website, to look at the summary or the issues paper to make a submission and also uh, to tell anybody who you think might be interested in in this um, direct them to to our website you might just want to share the little animated video which we've got on our website uh, and encourage them to also uh, submit uh, so look i hope this has been helpful uh, once again, thank you all for tuning in. We really look forward to reading your submissions in March next year. Um,